let's move on a little bit. So this is a heel pain for a, for about a year, 58 year old male. He's a type two diabetic. He's relatively well controlled. Uh, BMI, he's a little bit bigger guy. History of surgery on the contralateral heel back in, I think this, um, we'll say it's like seven or eight years prior to me seeing him. And he's very, very happy with that result. Very happy. And this is what he had done. And it's an open procedure. He had a previous open medial incision on his heel. And I'll be honest, this was probably 2018, 19 that I saw this gentleman. So a few years back. And I had to actually go and figure out what in the heck he had done on his calcaneus because at that point I didn't really, I hadn't really heard much about it, but he had had an osteotomy of his calcaneus. Um, and that was an open Zadic osteotomy done within seven or eight years. So how are you approaching this? If this is this guy's x-ray here, Jan? Yeah. So the same thing, you know, after, you know, examining them, cause this, you know, this is very different than the last x-ray we saw. Um, you do not see as much, you know, the calcification along the heel. Uh, I mean, along the insertion and so forth of the Achilles. Uh, and so, you know, this is one, you know, I, I, I wouldn't get an MRI right away. I, I treat them with therapy, like you mentioned, maybe a mo immobilization. Uh, and then if they fail, all that conservative management, then I would get an MRI in this patient to look at the Haglins, the tendon quality and so forth at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll jump ahead a little bit, but here's his MRI. Oh yeah. So you can see he's got, you know, quite a bit of inflammation in that retrocalcaneal space. The tendon actually looks pretty good, doesn't it? Oh, the tendon looks great there. I mean, like, look, and when we say that, um, you can see here it's nice and gray and black along the entire part of the Achilles. So once again, we're looking at a sagittal image, and there is, if you if if everybody could recall in the last MRI we saw there was you know signal change, um, or white signal within the tendon, and here you don't see it. It's nice and black all the way along. Mm -hmm. Yep, pretty thin, pretty uniform, not fusiform or you know thickened throughout that throughout that tendon. It actually looks pretty good. Uh, you know, and the other thing is you can't appreciate it on just a single cut here, but, you know, he had a lot more calcification than you could really see on the x-ray as he kind of got down to the, the distal insertion, that insertional area. So I guess this one kind of, this was my first um, Zadig osteotomy. It made it kind of nice because he had had it on the other side. And by the time um, I saw him, <laughs> I had been uh, doing my uh, osteotomies of the calcaneus with the uh, MIS Burr. And so I reached out to our friend Oliver Shipper and um, had a you know talk with him a bit about you know how to do a Zadic osteotomy and to approach it with a minimally invasive um, approach. Um, but you can see here, here's the original article. I think from 1939 is when this article came out. So it's so interesting how we make full circle back to a technique that was used. But the idea was basically. By doing an osteotomy of the calcaneus, you effectively shorten it and you kind of shorten that, that lever arm. So in effect, you're in some respect, you're lengthening the lengthening the Achilles indirectly, and you're decompressing where you know that area where the um, Achilles attaches to the calcaneus. Jan, anything to add to that? No, I I, I think it's amazing that we <laughs> we thought we were so smart and then we go back to a very old technique. Yeah. And, you know, the problem, I think that that came, the, the, I think the reason the went away was, as I understand it, was there was problems with wound healing. Um, so that was a concern. Uh, it's not easy open to do it because you kind of get, you got to get that bone out uh, of there to decompress it. Um, and then you got to fix it somehow. So the one, this gentleman, this, that wasn't his x-ray. He had actually had a different looking x-ray, but I didn't, I didn't have it, but he had a plate on the medial side of his heel, which is, you know, you know, pick your poison a little bit if you're comparing that versus right. an open uh, tendon debridement. So uh, this is a Zadic osteotomy, and this is, uh, you know, this is in Oliver's work. This is this is mine. So if it doesn't look great, you can you can blame me. But uh, the this is uh, you know setting him up for a osteotomy, and I'm using a, quite a bit of fluoro <laughs> to mark out my uh, vertical limbs for my proposed um, osteotomy. And I do that with him in the lateral position. I use a mini C-arm in this case, I think a regular size C-arm is reasonable. 
Uh, but the th nice thing is you can get that little mini sea arm in there, especially if you have a, a nice new one that's got a little bit bigger field of view. And then you can bring your sea arm in and mark out. I mark out my, you can see on the bottom of the foot, I mark out where I want my burr to go um, as I'm passing it from uh, lateral to medial. And then I mark out where my limbs are going to be. And I, I use, a, uh, you can use a freer, in this case, I used a hemostat just to dissect up towards the top of the uh, calcaneus and to get everything mobilized before I do my, do my osteotomy. Um, I do this without the tourniquet up and um, Oliver's shown some work that I think it was Oliver, at least there's some thought that using, you know, keeping the tourniquet down can help with your non-union rates. Um, and then pooled irrigation, as we learned when we talked about uh, the minimally invasive bunions. So I, I make keep that incision a little more plantar, kind of towards the plantar side of the calcaneus, um, and then work my way up. Here's my proposed limbs. And then as I'm, I'm creating the limb, it's not a really a great x-ray here, but you can see from here to here, I'm closing down that osteotomy by dorsiflexing the ankle. And it's pretty amazing how powerful that can be. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know how, I mean, I try to get about a centimeter at the maximum, maximum at the apex of my oste, um, osteotomy or of my resection, and then um, get that to close down as, as much as possible. And then this is my, my follow-up x-ray here. Uh, Jan, yeah, that looks great. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I was going to say, you know, the one thing I would, I'm going to comment on this is that if I was doing this now, I, I, I changed my screw trajectory a little bit where I'd start at the same spot, but, um, and then put a second screw at the bottom. There was a question, fear of displacement or non-union. Yes, yes to both of them. And, you know, the general thought is, is that if you crack, if you don't green stick that plantar surface, that you need to add uh, an additional screw. So if I am... If I, if I feel like sometimes as you go, like, you know how you do an ache in and you, you bring it out and you can feel that the, the far cortex crack just a little bit. If I feel that in this case, then I add a more plantar um, uh, screw just to kind of give some additional support. Um, and, and again, I probably should have gotten this screw up just a little bit more. Then I get the threads into a little bit better bone on that subchondral uh, bone in this, in this situation. Go ahead, Jan. I, I, yeah, so a couple of comments. So uh, first about the osteotomy in terms of, you know, there was the question previously, what's actually causing the pain? Yeah. And so this kind of goes against, so, so like that bony prominence that you many times will have in the back here, like the Haglands, you still will have this that, you know, I can't, man, it's not what oh, sorry, it's not working, but um that small bony prominence right in the back, right above your screw that you have. Mm -hmm. Yep. So people can still feel that or not people can still feel it. Like you could still feel it during the case many times, um, even though it's decompressed. Oh, you got there. Yeah. So that's where when someone asks, like, does the bone spur cause the pain? I, this would almost prove it, it doesn't. Um, or or it's, it's, it's multifactorial. So because the bone spur stays and the patients get a lot better. Um, obviously you've decompressed the haglands, which is a little bit more proximal, uh, but that bone spur off the back of the heel is staying still, and, still there. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think this is a much, um, you could do it more MIS, as you said, I do use always and recommend, um, I'm not the expert in this, but anytime I fix anything around the heel, I will use, um, you know, uh, the, uh, headless compression screws. And so uh, I just think like I've, I've taken out so many screws around the heel that people have used headed screws. And since <laughs> I've taken a lot out, my own included, I've gone to using almost exclusively headless compression screws for anything that's a larger diameter. So if I'm just using like a three, five screw, I'm not really worried about it, but anything larger, uh, if there's a headless option, I'm usually using it. And I like when the, uh, you know, my, the company that I use when the rep brings those in, because I just, I want to avoid hardware prominence in this issue in, in yep. this area. Yep. I agree. I think that's, and, th and it might be mental uh, there. It might be that same thing you just were, you were mentioning about, you know, if they feel something on the, see something on the x-ray, it, it might be a little bit mental, but I, it's one less thing I have to think about in this case. Um, 
Yeah. So, and, and again, uh, I'll just reiterate, there is definitely a fear of displacement or non-union and I've say, seen x-rays flo floating around. Um, I think you have to be pretty critical in the OR that if, if you use this technique and you think there's potential that there is some violation of the plantar cortex to adding an additional screw, um, it more, a little more plantar based is, is important where I drew that kind of second. For you. So, and Nick, have you seen any late uh, displaced late, or have you seen any like at courses or something like that where the speakers have shown cases? Yeah, just um, I haven't seen any of my own. Knock on wood. I'm sure it's going to come in tomorrow. But um, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the ones that I've seen where they displace, um, and it usually is if there's violation of the plantar cortex. If it doesn't, green, you know what I mean. Yeah. If it doesn't green stick. It's interesting because you, it should be a relatively stable osteotomy. Yeah. Um, when are you allowing these patients to weight bear? <laughs> so I was thinking through this as well. And, you know, what I kind of have done is I'll put them in a boot at the time of the surgery because I'm not as worried about incision healing problems. And then I'll have them stay off of it and I'll try to protect them for uh, about six weeks. And I think they kind of auto protect, they seem to auto protect. Um, so I'm not super strict. I'll just say you stay off of it for six weeks and then, and then I'll re x-ray them at two and six weeks. And if they're looking pretty good, I'll let them start the physical therapy and weaning out of the boot and increasing activities. I think I'm a little bit on the conservative side with it. It sounds like some people are being far more aggressive with how early they weight bear them. Uh, and maybe that's okay. Uh, but that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. Yeah. How about you? No, about the same. I splint them. Um, yeah, and that's I, I think, more for me. And, and also I think just for pain control, right. I mean, you created a calcaneus yeah. fracture. Yeah. Um, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, but, the other thing that I think it's mentioned is that effectively you're shortening your, your heel cord or sorry, you're lengthening your, your heel cord as well, your Achilles. And so it, there's some thought that by closing this down, you're kind of indirectly lengthening, lengthening things. And maybe that causes some of the pain relief as well. And, and I think that maybe remains to be seen. Yeah, but it, it's interesting that this, this, this osteotomy and procedure has, like you've shown, was written up originally in 1939. And I think in the last, what, three to five, maybe even less than five years has become more popular in the U.S. Yeah. It's already been used in Europe. We're, we're kind of slow and in, in, yeah, we're slow to um, accept it here. So, Jan, earlier you mentioned uh, using more minimally invasive um, approaches for the for this pathology. Is this what you're referring to, or are you referring to other, any other techniques? This is what I'm referring to. I know some people will use uh, like an endoscopy of the tendon. Um, I am. That's. Uh, I, I, I would say too advanced for me, I would say. Um, I think for people who are very skilled in it, they can do it very well. Um, but I think for me, this is, you know, I, I'm also in trauma. So this is like creating a fracture and fixing it. Yeah, this is right up your alley, isn't it? Yeah, so <laughs> keep it simple. Yeah, the, the, I like using the endoscopy for, for these, but, you know, this is not, I don't think this is one in which I would do it. I, you know, I kind of looked at it again now when I was putting this together and thinking, man, could I have done a endoscopic resection? But I think at the insertion point, I think that there was too much, uh, you know, calcific changes, intertendinous calcific changes that I would have been concerned that that might not have been uh, a great option uh, for this particular patient. Um, and maybe there's others that would disagree, but I do like using some endoscopy for when there's just that, that prominence and you get a little bit of uh, that retrocalcaneal bursa that gets irritated. And sometimes you can see some edema changes on the bone.